So this video is a video response to a Veritasium video on the trillion dollar equation. And here is the trillion dollar equation, the Black-Scholes equation. And what I wanna do is a deep dive into the math behind the equation. So the video does a great job with the history, telling you what it means, where it comes from, why it's important. And today I'm gonna to tell you the math behind it. Okay, so these are screenshots from the actual video with a nice example of what's going on here. So there's some stock price and it's going up and down and up and down. That is called ST. And on some date T, on the example they gave was the 25th of March, 2024, the stock price has some price. And in fact, here it is, S of T is exactly $100. And then what happens is you buy the option to buy the stock for $100, but not on March 25th, 2024, at this later time, this final time, the 25th of March, 2025. I'm going to call that capital T. And in the video, they gave examples. They said, you know, suppose the stock price goes up, up, up. If the stock price goes up to $130 and you have the option to buy it for only $100, then you can make some profit. And they said you can make $30 in profit because um, you buy the stock for $100, you can go on the open market, sell it for $130. Um, on the other hand, another thing could happen, maybe this would be more unfortunate for you, if the stock price goes down to $70, then you're not gonna make any profit. Um, but the good thing is, you only lose your initial $10. So you pay $10 for the option, but if the stock price goes down really far, you don't lose all of your money, you only lose the initial $10. And that's because you can choose not to exercise your option. And they gave this nice graph over here, of how much money you make, the profit and loss, depending on the stock price at, at the final time. And so if the stock price goes up, you can make money. That's all this area over here, profit. And if the stock price goes down, then you will lose money. Let's call this function. Let's give it a name since we wanna do some math in this video. Let's give this a name, let's call it K of X. So let's call K of X, how much money you make when the final stock price, the stock price at the exercise time, at this later time, capital T, when that is X, then you make K of X dollars at the final at time T. And the whole Black-Scholes equation is for a special function that I'm going to call lowercase v. And it's going to be V of ST. It's going to depend on two things, the stock price S and the current time T. And all it is, it's the expected value of your option. And how could we write that? Mathematically, we would write K, the function K, this K right over here, of S sub capital T. And what this is saying is, look forward into the future. That's the time capital T over here in March 2025. And apply the function K. That's how much money you make or lose, depending on what happens at that future time. Apply that to S sub capital T, the stock price at this later time. So S sub capital T is the stock price over here at the end. And V of ST is the expected value, the expected profit and loss for this option to buy it. This is all starting from, we wanna start from S of T equals lowercase s. So given our current information, how much as a function of the current stock price and the current time, how much is this option worth? That's the V of ST and that's what we're gonna solve for. In this video, that's what the Black-Scholes equation is doing. Here are some more, some more very crazy all over the place screenshots from the video. And they said that the way you prove this thing the way you find the equation for V is you consider this funny pi and you say it's V minus delta times S. And what they're doing is they are making a portfolio. So P here stands for portfolio. Portfolio, there's a, oh, a Greek P for portfolio. And the portfolio has two things. It has V, which is the value of our option. That was the function we had before. Minus some delta times the original stock. By choosing the right thing, you can make this portfolio a risk-free portfolio. And by knowing it's a risk-free portfolio, you can find the Black-Scholes equation and find this equation for the function V and solve for the function V if you want. And so really what I wanna do in the rest of the video is go over these long equations that appeared in the video. So these kind of like flash by in two seconds in that video, and they started at the top, they started with this hedged portfolio, the portfolio which was V, in this case, it is the value of your stock option, S C comma T. And by hedging it cor correctly with the right delta value and buying copies of the stock S, you can do a whole bunch of math and see the change in your portfolio. You can make it risk-free. And when it's risk-free, you can use that to solve and finally get to this Black-Scholes equation. 
So what I'm going to do in the rest of the video is do this whole thing, but not in two seconds like they did in the Veritasium video. I'm going to do it slowly from start to finish, assuming nothing. I'm not going to assume Ido's Lemma. So here it says Ido's Lemma. I'm not going to assume you know Ido's Lemma. I'm not going to assume you know what a brand new motion with drift is. I'm going to start kind of with nothing and just derive all this stuff all at once and try to get to, at the very end, uh, this equation uh, and maybe even say a little bit more about it. Derive... The Black-Scholes equation, Black-Scholes equation, which is this partial differential equation for the function v. So v is a function of two variables, s and t. s represents the current stock price, and t represents the current time. And v of st is the value of our option at this current time. And we can write that as the expected value of k of s capital T given st equals lowercase s. So you see the two inputs to the function, s and t, they appear over here in what we are given, and we look forward in time to some final time, capital T. That's the time at which we can exercise our option. This is a European style option, which has some final time t where you exercise it. And the function k was that hockey stick function that looks like this, um, that tells you uh, how much profit or loss you have depending on the final, the final stock price, st. And we wanna, know what this is and the way we're going to do it is we're going to come up with this uh, black scholes equation which is going to be a partial differential equation that v this function v of st satisfies and the way we're going to do it is we're going to make this portfolio so in the veritasium video they used pi for portfolio and they said pi equals capital v minus a delta s that's what they wrote so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put t's everywhere. So I wanna make sure we know these things are functions of time. So this is our portfolio as a function of time. Capital V is a function of time. And S is a function of time. Uh, we'll see later that delta will actually be a function of time too. But for now, I'm gonna just leave it as delta and we're gonna discover what delta has to be. Uh, what is capital V sub t? Capital V sub t is supposed to represent the value if we had bought the option, the price of the option might go up and down. So for example, if the stock gets really close to being in the money, you would imagine the option becomes more valuable. V of t goes up. If the uh, price of the stock goes down a lot and the option is very unlikely to be worth anything, then V of t would be very close to zero. Um, what is V of t actually? It's actually just the lowercase function V evaluated at st comma t. So if you tell me the current stock price st and the current time t, and I plug those things into the lowercase function v, that tells me the value. That's capital V. Um, so this is a nice a nice little upgrade. And already we have things, we're ready to do some math um, as we do. And what we're gonna calculate is how this thing is changing over time. Um, and you might be used to just taking derivatives and that's all very nice. The problem with these functions is they are very jagged Brownian-like functions that are actually not differentiable. So what you do instead of doing derivatives, you do differences. Right? You can't do the derivative of something if it's too spiky, but you can take the difference between two points. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this very simple difference, which is pi of t plus dt minus pi of t. And by the way, what I'm gonna do in this video, I'm not gonna do anything rigorously. So of course, dt doesn't actually mean anything. You should just think of it as a small change in time t. And we're gonna get something that is the right answer. If you wanted to prove it rigorously, it would be a lot more work and we're not gonna do that. Um, by the way, some people call this pi of t plus dt minus pi of t. They call that d pi, d pi. I'm gonna put a d pi uh, right near my face right here. Uh, so d pi of t just means this difference and that's what we're gonna calculate. Okay, what is it by our formula? It's simply v of st plus dt comma t plus dt, right? I'm just plugging in right here into this guy minus the same thing at st comma t similarly plugging into this term over here you're going to have a minus delta times st plus dt minus st okay now is the only time in the video where we are going to use some calculus and we're going to assume that the function v this nice function v the granddaddy function that we're solving for we're going to assume that this function is a nice smooth function that can be approximated by its derivatives. So we assume v is differentiable and can be approximated by its derivatives. Uh, approximate 
we're going to approximate v by its derivatives. And what do I mean by that? So if you've taken a calculus course, if you've seen calculus, you know that you can approximate a function by its tangent line. We're going to do that, but in two dimensions. And I guess technically what you could say is we're approximating it by the Taylor series expansion. And so what I'm going to do is this difference, how much did V change um, from this input T to this input T plus delta T, you can approximate that by its derivative. And so this is a fancy version, fancy 2D version of f of x plus dx minus f of x is approximately equal to dx times f prime of x, right? So if you change the input by a small amount dx, how much does the output change? Well, it changes by dx times the derivative of the function. So we're gonna use that over here for the function v, but we're gonna do it in two dimensions. So there's gonna be two parts because we changed two things. We changed the time value and we changed the s value. And so because we changed two things, we're gonna have two terms. Um, the first term is from just changing the time value. So I'm just taking this difference over here and putting it all the way here. And we're gonna get, how much did it change? Well, one thing is gonna be depending on partial v, partial t, evaluated at st comma t times dt. So because time changed by, went from t to t plus dt, we change time by this amount dt, you end up with a dt times the time derivative partial t. So this is a version of this kind of calculus thing that you see approximating the change in a function by its derivative. If you want it to be extra precise, you would do the next order term. And the next order term would be plus one half partial squared v partial t squared. So now we're taking two t derivatives of v, again, evaluated at st comma t, and then you would multiply by dt squared, the difference squared. And you would keep going and so on and so on and so on. If you've taken a calculus course, you know that, of course, uh, dt squared, people say, is so small that it doesn't matter. And if when you do a rigorous derivation of this, you would actually do some limits and you would show that in the limit, this dt squared term is not contributing to anything. So even though this dt term will survive in the limit and will matter, dt squared does not survive in the limit and will not matter. Um, some people just write this down as dt squared equals zero, which is a nice kind of shorthand to have that dt squared equals zero. And in any case, for us, this whole term is going to disappear. We're not going to write it down. And you just have to, I guess, believe me that it works the way I say. Okay, that is it for the change in t. We also changed one other thing. We changed the value of s. And because we changed the value of s, we are also going to change um, according to the derivatives of v with respect to the input s. Okay, so there's going to be a term that looks very similar, partial v, partial s. Okay, and this is one thing you got to be careful of. There are two s's floating around. There is the function v of s t that has input lowercase s and um, lowercase t. And then there's capital S sub t, which is this random process. And you got to make sure you understand which is which. I'm doing partial v partial s. I mean, this is an honest function. It's got two inputs. Please take the derivative with respect to the first input s. That's what partial v partial s means. And I'm evaluating that at st comma t. And then I multiply by how much I changed it. How much did I change it? Well, I went from st to st plus dt. And so the change is times st uh, plus dt minus st. That's how much I changed the s. And that is why I need to include this term. Uh, okay, just like before, got to do higher order terms. Before it turned out that the higher order terms were zero. For this, the changes in the s, the higher order terms are not zero. You definitely have to include them or you will get the wrong answer. So the next order term is one half partial squared v partial s squared of st comma t. And how much did we change things? st plus dt minus st all squared. Okay, very nice. Uh, very technically speaking, if you want to Google this stuff, you should look up the Taylor expansion or something like that. We've done a second order Taylor expansion in our function uh, v of st, but it really is just an extension of this idea of approximating by derivatives. I guess there are higher order terms, uh, higher order terms. And once again, if you really want to prove these terms are zero, you could, uh, and it turns out they're zero. So you only need these two terms and 
Gotta believe me for now, for that those are the only terms we're gonna need. Okay, there's one more thing we put on here, which is this delta, again with an st minus. Um, st. Uh, look, we already have that term over here, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna sneak in that delta. Very nice stuff. Now is where we need some assumptions about the stock S. So the Black-Scholes equation, you can get it for the stock doing various things. If you make some assumption, some model of what the stock is doing, then you get the PDE. And the classical Black-Scholes equation is for a very particular thing, which was also shown in the Ver Veritasium video. We are going to assume. And in the video, they said, well, okay, the, the simplest possible model you could have for a stock price is that ST is going up and down randomly, just like a Brownian motion. You know, they had that video of people pulling the rope up and down, and uh, that kind of model would say ST is changing the same way a Brownian motion changes. The way we write this down in this land of stochastic differential equations, we would write DST equals, and then we say DZ, and if we're being extra careful, we'd say DZT, whereas ZT is a Brownian motion. And so it's, it's a little complicated to say exactly what a brand new motion is. It's a kind of a slippery mathematical object. Um, but you can imagine it's just a jagged line that goes up and down. It's equally likely to go up and down. They talked about it a bit in the video. And the first guy to study this, I guess, uh, I, I confess I've already forgotten his name, but his advisor was Poincaré. So this is, this is the kids, if you're going to get a really famous PhD advisor, everyone's going to forget who you are. Uh, so <laughs> Poincaré's student um, was like, I want to model the stock price as a Brownian motion. The problem with Brownian motions is they go up and down, they become negative, and the stock price can't go negative. So it's a little bit funny. Um, so later on, people said, you know what would be a better model than just the Brownian motion? Why don't we make something called a geometric Brownian motion? Um, and so right now, I'm just saying the stock price is changing like a Brownian motion. In a geometric Brownian motion, you add in some terms, and that makes sure that the stock price is very roughly speaking um, e to the power of a Brownian motion. And this is called the geometric Brownian motion. And by doing this extra factor of E, even if the Brownian motion becomes very negative, then the stock price is still a positive number, maybe very close to zero, um, but it's always a positive thing. It makes a little bit more sense. Um, it also makes sense from the point of view that the bigger the stock is, the more you expect it to change. So all the changes should sort of be proportional to S. And so the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna throw a big fat ST in front of the DZT. And that says the size of the changes, how much it's changing, is proportional to the size of the stock. The bigger the stock is, the bigger swings it has. And we're gonna add in this proportionality constant called sigma, and sigma is sometimes called the volatility. And that is the constant of proportionality between the size of S and how big the fluctuations are. So sigma times ST dZT is dSC. The stock can also move up and down on average, and that is what we call mu. Um, so it's gonna have some mu dT, and again, it's not going to be just mu, it's going to be mu st, dt, plus this stuff. And mu is sometimes called the, the drift. I guess in this case, mu st is the drift. So mu is like the drift rate, and mu times st is the actual. So that is our model. This is called a geometric Brownian motion. And they had this flashed on the screen in the Veritasium video as well. So we're going to assume that DST satisfies this thing. How is the stock changing over time? Well, it's going up according to this drift rate mu times the size of the stock, and then it's jumping up and down all jiggly proportional to sigma times ST um, times some Brownian motion that is representing this idea of this unknown factor of randomness pulling the stock up and down. Um, so this is a geometric Brownian motion, and it tells you something about DST. Well, very fortunately for us, we have DST appearing in our equation. Um, S DST is exactly what this thing means. ST plus DT minus ST, that is exactly a DST. So DST, we can plug it right in to our equations. And what you're gonna find is that when you put in um, the formula for DST over here, it's gonna be very nice. Over here, we're gonna have a DST squared. You see that DST squared. And so it's worth our time to let's investigate what DST squared is. We have this formula for DST, this drift part plus this random part. Let's square it and see what happens. So uh, once again, ST plus DT minus ST. This is equal to DST 
Um, that's the formula we have. If we square it, let's see what happens. And of course, when you square things, there's two parts. Square the first term, square the last. So mu st dt all squared. That's squaring the first term. Like we said before, a dt squared is so small, it's negligible. I had a professor who told me the uh, analysis is the art of knowing which terms are so small they don't matter, and which terms are still very small but do matter. And in this case, a dt squared is so small it doesn't matter. Of course, a dt does matter, but a dt squared, no bueno, all gone, doesn't matter. 2 times mu st times dt times sigma st dzt. That is the doubling of the product. And once again, so even though a Brownian motion changing is a real thing that matters, and even though dt is a real thing that matters, both of them are small enough that when you multiply them together, it will not matter. So just like dt squared is zero, this term is equal to zero. Last but not least, we have the square of the last term. We have plus the square of the last term plus sigma squared, st squared times dzt all squared. And this to me is the point where stochastic calculus gets really exciting and interesting and weird because even though dt squared is zero, and even though dt times dzt is zero, they don't matter. dzt squared, you would reasonably think that it doesn't matter, that is also zero. The change in a Brownian motion, it's, you know, it's changing, it's a continuous function, it's changing by just a little bit. When you square it, it should also be zero, right? If it was a differentiable function, this for sure would be zero, because for differentiable functions, the change in the function is proportional to the change in time. So for differential functions, dft is equal to dt times f prime of t. And so when you square it, it's like dt squared. It doesn't matter. Um, but for a Brownian motion, it's a not differentiable function. And because it's so jagged, the dzt squared does matter. And in fact, there's a miracle happens that dzt for a Brownian motion, and this is kind of what makes a Brownian motion a Brownian motion, when you square its increment, you can replace that with dt. You can replace that with dt. Uh, so actually, this whole thing is equal to simply sigma squared st squared times dt. Uh, this is the miracle, I think, of stochastic calculus, is that you can replace the square of the change in a Brownian motion by a dt. Of course, if you want to make rigorous sense of this thing, you have to do a little bit more work. And some people, they package this up, they say this is what Ito's lemma is saying. So Ito's lemma, in some sense, is this result that dzt squared equals dt. Okay, in any case, I, I think I've, we've done this in enough detail. Let's say we can pretend that uh, the change in s all squared is equal to this, sigma squared st squared dt. And let's look at our equation over here. Uh, I'm gonna plug that in right here. So we're calculating the change in our portfolio value, which is d pi, d pi t. And d pi t, we said was equal to what? Partial v, partial t. All evaluated at st comma t. Uh, this is one thing that really bothers me when you see these derivations in a lot of places, they won't write st comma t. So they say partial v, partial t, and you're supposed to know that they're plugging in st comma t. I think it's really important, especially since st is a random variable. <laughs> like you, you're plugging in a random variable. Anyway, uh, let's keep going. Uh, st comma t, what else do I got? Times dt, I got the times dt. Uh, over here, I'm gonna leave this one as written plus partial v partial s at st comma t minus delta times uh, st plus dt minus st. Uh, we could plug in what this is because we know what it is, but I'm gonna leave it for now and you'll see why in one second. Uh, but crucially, the last part is also a dt uh, plus one half partial squared v partial s squared uh, evaluated at st comma t times sigma squared st squared times dt. So that is precisely this term that we plugged in. Now, if you look at this, our portfolio is changing in time. So our portfolio is going up, it's going down. How is it changing in time? Well, there's a part that is depending only on time, only depending only on dt. And that's the first and the last term. 
Then there is a middle term that depends on how the actual stock is changing. So in other words, we've, by mathematically expanding it out this way, we've split things up into three terms, and the first and the third term are completely non-random. There's a DT term, they're growing you know, in time according to how much time has changed. And the only randomness in how things are changing, the only fluctuations of this like rope pulling up and down that causes the random fluctuations that we can't predict is coming from this ST plus DT minus ST term here in the middle. And if only we could remove that term, if we could somehow delete the second term from existence, then we'd be very happy because it would mean our portfolio has no randomness. We would have a risk-free portfolio. It would kind of do things deterministically. It would always be going up. It would not be jiggling up and down. Okay, so if we could eliminate this middle term, we would be very happy. And fortunately for us, because delta is a free parameter here, we can eliminate the middle term just by setting delta so that this stuff cancels. So we're gonna set delta equal to partial V, partial S of ST comma T. And by doing that, the middle term goes away completely. So middle term cancels. And what are we left with? Then we're left with d pi t is something that only depends on dt. So by doing that, there's no jiggle in left in pi t. It's a risk-free portfolio. It, it doesn't sometimes go up and sometimes goes down. It, sometimes, it always has this deterministic dt behavior. This is a miracle thing. So if you're able to make this risk-free portfolio, this means that you can set this up if you can do this, and then you won't, if the stock price goes up, if the stock price goes down, you don't care. This jiggle doesn't bother you. Uh, the stock price is always going up deterministically with this DT sorry, uh, amount. Uh, this is great for us. And in the original Black-Scholes derivation, what they said is, let's assume that markets are efficient. And when you have a risk free for portfolio, it must be that you're getting the same return as if you had invested in a sort of risk-free portfolio, the easy way by just going and buying, uh, you know, the the risk-free rate from the Federal Reserve that goes up at some interest rate R. And so, the risk-free interest rate R that portfolio is this d pi t equals R times pi t dt. So you're growing at rate R in proportion to how much money you have. And they're saying, if it is true that our uh, portfolio is truly risk-free, then it must be the same as this other risk-free portfolio. So therefore, by equating these two, so I don't know, let's call this equation one and call this equation two. Since equation one equals equation two, assuming efficient markets the right-hand side over here equals the right-hand side over here. Okay, so we get an equation, therefore, and we can write the equation. Let's copy everything down. Okay. Uh, and I'm, I'm just gonna, I'm not even gonna write the DT, but I'm gonna just cancel the DT from both sides. So since one equals two, cancel DT from both sides. So what have we done? We have a mix of derivatives of V that represent how the portfolio is changing. And on the left-hand side, it's how the portfolio is changing um, in a way that we made it risk-free. And on the right-hand side is something involving the risk-free interest rate R. And by equating these two and saying they must be the same, that gives us a partial differential equation that must satisfy. So actually, this whole thing is exactly the Black-Scholes. This is the derivation that I was taught when I took a, a course called PDEs for Finance and Stochastic Calculus. There is one thing when I was writing this up that really bothered me, which is that delta is actually a function of t. And because delta is a function of t and s, way back when we did the derivative earlier on, look, we pretended that delta was a constant. We said delta is a constant over here. And it really bothers me. I can't figure out where I went wrong or if there's some simple explanation around this. But if delta is not a constant, then is something wrong? I don't know. Probably the Black-Scholes formula is still correct. And I'm the one who's uh, missing out. 
but uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, this video has gone on long enough. Yeah, if you know why, leave a comment. <laughs> All right, take care.